Okay, first of all, we, we need to know what fraud is, and according to the criminal code, everyone who by deceit, falsehood, or other fraudulent means, whether or not it is a false pretense within the meaning of this act, defrauds the public or any person, whether ascertained or not, of any property, money, valuable security, or any service. So what does that mean to us as lay people? In other words, fraud is a deliberate misrepresentation which causes another person to suffer damages and it's usually a monetary loss. Fraud versus theft. What is the difference between the two? Fraud is hidden. Okay? We don't know that it's happening. It can take a very long time for it to, to, uh, to surface. You're willingly uh, will part with the property based on the representation. Okay. So in other words, behind the act itself, we don't know that a person is actually trying to commit fraud against us. And there's usually a time lag. And I'm sure you've read it in the news, Bernie Madoff, these people, etc., etc. It can go for a long period of time. Years. On the other hand, theft, it's overt, it's in the open. We can see that somebody's actually going to try and commit theft. And we're unwillingly to part with any of the property. We don't want anybody to steal our property. And it's immediate. It happens straight away. So who commits fraud? Well, that's an interesting question. Look around you. you know? It can be anybody. And it's usually the people that you tend to trust the most within your organization. Okay? I'm not trying to scare anybody, but a lot of the times it's the people within the, in the within the organization that we hold dear to our hearts, especially in nonprofits, volunteers. We tend to stereotype people. Um, if you were to look out your window at the middle of the night and see four guys standing on the street corner, you would say to yourself, they're up to something. I can guarantee you that there's not going to be four guys standing on the street corner during the night trying to commit fraud against your organization. Okay? These people you can't see. So who commits fraud externally? We have suppliers, vendors. Those people that we buy things from could possibly try to commit fraud against your organization. How can they do that? Generally, by false invoicing. They're going to invoice you for more than what was agreed. Or they're going to short shipment. Or they're going to give you less goods than what you actually order, but still charge you the higher price. Or shipments. Competitors. Doesn't really matter too much within the nonprofit uh, sector. However, in the in the private sector, an example here was Espionage, Air Canada, and WestJet. I don't know if they remember a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe it was Air Canada was able to get the the accounts receivable of WestJet, their their uh, all their information, and they took it to court. Price fixing the oil companies. We know what happens every time oil goes up, gas goes up. On a weekend, long weekend, gas prices go up. You're all talking. Comment, door to door requests for donations. I mean, we tend to get this a lot in our neighborhood. People are coming around asking for donations. Um, are they really who they say they are? We can all make a badge up, say we can represent somebody, give them money, and they could be gone with that. And they could be representing your organization. <clears throat> Customers, in terms of if you are <clears throat> providing a service, uh, customers can tend, uh, would tend to uh, order a, a lot of stuff from you, um, 
or if you're, if you're supplying like a, 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 some sort of a good, they will get a lot of those goods and then they will commit bankruptcy. So there's no way you're going to be able to recover those funds. So who commits fraud internally? This is probably where a lot of people are more interested. Employees. The biggest <coughs> asset of the company could be the people that take them down. Volunteers. You can't forget about volunteers. Just because we're paying somebody doesn't mean to say that they're going to be the people that are going to commit the fraud against us. So we have theft of assets, cash being one of them. We have fixed assets, computers. Even just taking them computers home, borrowing, borrowing them for the weekend and bringing them back. Going on to the internet without your permission. It's still a theft of an asset. Lapping, payroll, and skimming. I'll come back to the lapping later on. Um, we'll review the payroll. Lapping is simply uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's right. Uh, payroll will be uh, in terms of false employees, and skimming is actually taking cash from the organization before it is entered onto the books. Managers. Managers can manipulate the system. Okay? They know what the internal controls are. And they know how to get around it. So we have to have something in place where managers can actually look after other managers and it can go up the board level, the audit committee, somebody to report to, and have transparency. Kickbacks. We tend to get uh, kickbacks in the government set on contracts, big contracts, where nah, one recently in Hamilton that hit the news, where uh, <coughs> one of the, the managers in the construction side of the, uh, of the um, municipality was able to get $5,000 of a kickback because he was able to grant the contract to a certain supplier. Expense claims. We all go away on conferences. We come back. We put our claims in. I have seen it happen where a manager was going away at a conference, decided to pay for it on his credit card, paid for it, got the bill, got the ticket. He then decided to cancel that ticket go via another route, which was cheaper, put that on his credit card. However, when he got back to the organization, he put the claim in for the higher ticket. So he was able to pocket the difference between the two. Okay? So when people are looking at expense claims, they have to be aware that Dates. They have to look at dates. They have to make sure that people went on the conference when they said they were going. Okay. A lot of organizations will book through, book through one travel agency and won't let anybody else do the bookings apart from themselves. Officers of the organization. False financial reporting. Funder reports and government reports. This is an area where I think it's very important when, when it comes to this sector, and I have seen it where government, re government reports have been um, falsified in order to be able to get the funding for next year. Okay. We've often heard it said that if I don't spend the money this year, I'm not going to get it next year. So therefore, I have to make sure I spend it all. I have seen officers within the organization move money around within the accounts to falsify that, to say that they have spent it when actually they have they haven't. Uh, I've also seen the government reports that didn't reflect the financials at all. That will not get picked up on an external audit. We, we, we think that it would. However, the auditors 
are not there to, uh, to specifically look for fraud. They will bring it up if they see it. Um, but uh, they're there to look at the, in, at the um, at GAP and ensure that um, your organization is uh, complying with the rules. Directors of the company. It could be a conflict of interest. I'm currently working with an organization at the moment where one of the board of directors has their family working in the organization doing maintenance work under <laughs> under the uh, an animal control contract. So we are carefully looking at this contract, gathering the information, and uh, once we're happy that we have enough evidence, we will then take it to the board. So uh, there was no conflict of interest declared there, and obviously we got the, the related party transactions. If you are on a board, make sure you're, you've got no conflicts at all. Okay. Keep yourself clean. Okay, in order for fraud to be committed, there has to be three things, or three components. There has to be opportunity. There must be an opportunity for a person to commit fraud. There has to be pressure. And there has to be rationalization. It's quite often been said that a female will commit fraud for need, and a male will commit fraud for greed. Taking a family situation, that the mother being the nucleus of kids, she wants to maintain that standard of living for her family. She doesn't want her family to be brought to shame if they have to move because she's taken a big cut in pay or her husband has lost his job. Whereas the male, he wants the big cars, the flashy boats. So on the opportunity side, uh, there must always be a way to abuse the position of trust without getting caught. This is where we trust our volunteers, we, we trust our managers, our employees. So if we were to place $500 in a coffee room with a note that says, please do not steal, how long is that going to stay there? We have just given somebody the opportunity. We have to take that away from them. How does the opportunity arise? Lack of internal controls. It doesn't matter whether you're a small organization, a large organization, you have to have internal controls. The opportunity again through honesty and trust. We trust that person that comes in every weekend stays late at night because they're doing such a great job for us. They don't take the holidays. Pressure. What's the motivation behind it? And there has to be some motivation. Some of the examples are the inability to pay their bills. Their partner could have lost their job. They may have a gambling or a drug addiction. And you, and you may not know that. You know, these people are very good at hiding the fact that they have a problem. On the corporate side, they're not meeting the earnings targets for the investors. Okay? They have to have those sales. You know? Have to have those sales. They're not meeting producti productivity targets within the factory. And of course, status. We all <coughs> look at each other in different ways, and uh, we uh, symbolize each other. So, that nice house, that nice car. There might be family problems, uh, <coughs> sickness, uh, marital problems. But there are also some issues that are going to pressure that person. So we have the opportunity, and now the pressure's there. 
Now there has to be rationalization. I'm just borrowing the funds. I'm going to put it back. This is a good one with petty cash. Those organizations that have petty cash funds. I've seen some funds at two and a half thousand dollars. What do you want petty cash two and a half thousand dollars for? Hundred bucks is all you need. Right? You're only going to go get milk. Yeah, that's all you need it for. Person doing the books, a little bit short that month. They can't pay the rent. So I'll take eight hundred bucks. Nobody's going to miss it. Nobody will. I'll put it back next month. Next month, kids have got to get their teeth done. Have to pay that out. Now the eight hundred bucks has still hasn't gone back into the pay cash fund. They then put it back. They never got caught. They got away with it once. A couple of months later, they do it again. And then eventually, what happens is the money doesn't get replaced, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. I deserve it. I'm underpaid. We're all underpaid. <laughs> to some degree. Right? We're all underpaid to some degree. We all work hard. I should have been promoted by now. I've been here 20 years. Joe Schmuck has only been here five years and he's been promoted to manager. That money's mine, not his. Hey, it's only the government. It's their money, not ours. I came across an incident where an executive director of a nonprofit was putting thousands of dollars a year into an RSP. Okay. It's only the government's money, not ours. I'm not hurting anyone. You know? I'm not hurting anyone at all. I'll put the money back. However, when it snowballs and gets too big, the people that you are providing the service to are the people that are going to get help. Others are doing it. I'm going to do it. They can get away with it. So can I. Okay. So we have red flags. What's going, what are the indicators that somebody could be committing fraud? I don't want everybody to take these as gospel truth, all right? <laughs> these are indicators. Okay, an irregularity that may relate to time, frequency, and place. And a map. So it can be done over a period of time. It, uh, it can be a different frequency, it can be at a different place, and it can be a, diff be a different amount. And let me give you an example on the amount. You have a policy within your organization that says anything over $5,000 has to be approved by the manager. So the person doing the books goes, hmm, okay. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll buy something for $4,999. You don't have to go through the approval process because it's just done. Or they get a contract that says it's you know, $9,000. Instead of having the one contract signed, they'll split it in two and have it and, and just do it four and a half each. But where's the invoice coming from? Who's providing the service? It could be a sham company. A big organization. It's likely that you could miss it unless you have the internal controls in place. Okay, more red flags. Living beyond means. You have that bookkeeper who is getting paid $30,000 a year, is driving into work in a Lamborghini. Something wrong. And unless he's told you that he has won the lottery or come into some money, 
And if you already know one of his grandparents have died, and he now tells you that he committed some money because his grandparents have died, then you know there's something wrong. Personal financial losses. Prime example was the stock market. That's how Bernie made up our cause. Because of the financial stock market. It started to crash. People got worried. And they wanted their money out. They went to him. He didn't have it. He didn't have it. The addiction problems. We briefly dis discussed that. Change in personal circumstances. Could be a divorce. A lot of pressure there. Outside business interests. Could be that they have a relative is providing service that you need. However, you don't know that he is related, he or she is related to that vendor. They can collude, inflate the invoice price, the same service that you would have got cheaper somewhere else, and now this person gets a little bit of a kickback. Somebody who rarely takes vacation. I don't know why anybody would want to take vacation. We all work for two things, vacation and retirement. That's why we go to work. So if there's somebody in your organization that's not taking holidays, there's something wrong. Possibly. And a lot, of, a lot of these things that, that come to arise is because, because of people who haven't taken vacations. And then when they do, and somebody comes into the organization to pick up the slack while they're away on vacation, this is where the, the, the problems, we can see what's been going on. OK, some more red flags. Uh, rationalizes poor performance. You know, I'm sorry I'm not doing a good job. But been having problems lately. You provide unreliable work, dissatisfied with your job. A lot of people are dissatisfied, but you still have to go to work. They have a close association to suppliers or competitors. And I think the one to watch there would probably be the suppliers. Somebody who likes to beat the system. Inflated ego. Somebody who drives driving for success. They've got to be at the top of the game all the time. Sudden mood swings or personality changes. Pressure there. The numbers. The numbers are not coming. They're not what was the, pers the person was hoping for. They were hoping to make X amount of dollars profit. And they didn't. Sleepless nights. Here we have the fraud tree. This, is a, this was produced by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And this is the asset mis misappropriation. <coughs> And we have cash, fraudulent disbursements, and inventory. What about time? Sorry? If somebody steals time. Time? Sure. Absolutely. <coughs> uh, we can discuss that a little bit. The table. So this just gives you an idea of uh, how the uh, how the associations actually uh, broke it down in terms of like cash, larceny. Uh, we have unrecorded revenues. We'll go into a couple of these in a little bit more detail. All right, fraud in the revenue cycle. How does that happen? We have front end fraud or skimming, as it's known. We have false sales invoices. May or may not affect your organization. We have lapping of accounts receivable. So what does all that mean in terms of revenue? Okay, front end frauds. This is cash donations. This is going to be the hardest one to be able to detect. This is when cash is taken before it's recorded in the books. Before the cash is recorded in the books, it's diverted. So your organization is out collecting money for whatever. Uh, and they actually, they, whoever's collecting the money actually pockets the cash before we can get it onto the books. 
to get around that, have two people do it. Two people that don't know each other. Otherwise, there might be collusion. <coughs> Donors are directed elsewhere. Instead of giving to your charity, they're being asked to give to another one. That charity might be a sham charity. Might be a charity that really doesn't exist. Misappropriation of purchase rebates. And misappropriation of miscellaneous revenues. If it does get onto the books, the only way around it is by doing journal entries. I'm trying to hide it. Okay, we have uh, invoices that are altered to reflect, their, reflect a lower sales amount. And we have invoices that are altered to reflect a higher sales amount. I know in some of the organizations that I have dealt with, they, in terms of donors, when they get uh, a check-in or some cash coming in, I've said to them, well, take that and put an invoice onto that through the accounts receivable and apply the cash or the check off the accounts receivable. That way you've got a record, one of your donors. Make sure that you issue a letter thanking them. And if you're eligible to give a tax receipt, make sure you issue the tax receipt. Okay. Robbing Peter to pay Paul <laughs> as the lapping of accounts receivable. So how does this work? Okay. We have donor A, B, and C. Or we could be providing a service. <coughs> and we have invoiced A, B, or C. A decides to give us cash, but the person that's receiving the cash and recording the cash in the books decides they're going to put the money in their pocket. So A doesn't get paid off. Then B comes along. They decide to pay their invoice. So without, by not trying to get caught, the person recording the books pays off A. And then when C comes in and gives their money, they pay it off B. And that is what we call lapping. The person that's doing this has to be very, very good. They're keeping two sets of books. This is when, when people don't take their holidays, and you force them to take their holidays, <laughs> this is when they get caught. Because the, the books are not being kept the way they want them. So that is what we call lapping. Robbing Peter pays Paul. And this affects both nonprofit and for-profit organizations. There's absolutely no difference. Fraud in the cost cycle, false information, False supplier, supplier invoices. Again, going back to the invoice side, you could have ordered X amount of goods, received Y, and paid for more than what you should have got. How do we get around that? Well, we look at the receiving reports and match it up against the purchase order. If we have a purchase order system to make sure that we got the goods that we asked for. Then when the invoice comes in, we match it up with the invoice to make sure we got billed for what we asked for. However, that's easier said than done. Because in some organizations, we don't have the flexibility to segregate those duties. Because we're so small, we can only afford to hire one person. That's when the trust element comes into it. False expense reports. I spoke about that earlier in, ter in terms of the uh, the, uh, the flights. Again, here you need to be looking at dates. Make sure that the dates correspond with the expense report. And the expense report corresponds with the activity. People, I've seen it where people have gone out, taken people out for meals that had nothing to do with that, with that activity, and then claimed the money back. Payroll. We heard about time earlier on. We have 
what we call ghost employees. Employees that are on the books, they're no longer there. I know it's hard to believe, but it happens. There's still people being paid that don't work there anymore. And, and other things. Okay, let's look at false information. False financial statements. Higher up in the organizations, they have the ability to, to move numbers around. Why would they do that? Well, they want to make sure that they look good, that they are providing the job that people think that they're doing. Yeah, they'll overstate accounts and loans receivable. By doing this, they can inflate sales. It doesn't affect nonprofits too much unless you do sell stuff. So by over, overstating uh, the accounts receivable, we're actually overstating sales. We can understate accounts payable because that will also increase the profit. We can have fictitious suppliers. Somebody who is, for example, I went into a business where they had a large payroll and they, they if they thought there was something going on, they weren't too sure. So I looked at their payroll records and I analyzed all the names, all the SIN numbers, and all the addresses. And I took their purchase ledger, their vendor's ledger. And I analyzed all the vendors, the names, and the addresses. And lo and behold, one of the vendors matched the address of one of the people on the payroll. And looking into it further, they were supplying service to the company that the company wasn't getting. And the company was paying the invoice. Okay. So they created a sham company. They just typed up an invoice in Word, sent it into the company, and they paid it because they didn't have any internal controls. False asset valuations. Again, um, we can inflate the assets, make them look better on the balance sheet. False journal entries and altered internal company records. Policies, policies get changed. No policies at all. Well, we use this policy today, but tomorrow it doesn't fit the scenario, so I'll change it. <laughs> fit how I want it to fit. False supplier invoices, again, goods not received. We ordered them, didn't receive them, we pay the invoice. Inferior quality of goods. See this a lot on a construction site, on, on building sites, where they will order a certain type of cement to do a certain type of job, we'll get a lesser quality of cement. But pay for the higher quality. Service is not rendered or services that are rendered but not really to the standard that they should have been. I came across an organization in the health sector where they, were, they had asked uh, an organization to come in and do a workflow analysis and do a little bit of training. Well, when I looked at what they were getting for their training and the manuals that, that were put together, I would think that a, you know, a grade 12 high school student could have done a better job. And in terms of the report, I didn't see one. Yet they paid $20,000. This was a nonprofit charity organization in the health sector. And then I found out that the person who ran this company was a friend of the ED. So, was it fraud? You know, were they happy with what with what they got? Maybe they were. Was there a kickback? Maybe there was. It's 
really hard to say. Was it ethical? No. Okay, so we're invoiced for a higher value than the goods that we received. We discussed that earlier. We're invoiced for a higher quantity than we received. False expense reports, non-business items. These are items that people are basically wanting to put through the business that weren't used to generate revenue. Inflated items. You can see that some of this stuff is repeating itself. Fictitious items. Items that they're claiming for that they never had. Duplicate items. This one is, be careful with this one, because uh, you will get a receipt, an actual receipt, and then you will get a transaction receipt. Okay? I'm sure a lot of you have seen them when you've been out. Okay? People will put them in together as two different receipts to claim. Or they'll claim this week this receipt, and next week this one. Just take the actual receipt, or have them stapled together. Classic one. Whether it's done by mistake, it could be. Might not be done on purpose. Uh, secret commissions and kickbacks. Gifts. Cash. Travel. Okay, promise of travel. Entertainment. Consulting fees. Future benefits. Consulting fees are a good one for the auditors. Every time I've come across an auditor, got the auditors in, first place they go to, consulting fees. I want to know what's going on behind that. Consulting fees, miscellaneous expenses. Okay. After they check the accruals for the others. They want to know how much they're getting paid first. <laughs> Payroll. Okay. We can have fictitious employees. It does happen. Employees that have left the company, but the payroll supervisor has never taken them off. And they continue to pay them. The only thing that's changed is the bank account. Because it now belongs to the supervisor. Or somebody else. It is possible that the employee is left and is continuing to get the money. But it's giving, but it's giving half of it to the supervisor. So when, they, when the employee does get cut, say, hey, I wasn't working here anymore. You guys continue to pay me. Your problem, not mine. Inflated hours. Worked 30 hours, got paid for 40. Half an hour here, 15 minutes there, all adds up. You need to have some sort of control in place where that can be monitored. Inflated rates. Suppose you get $25 an hour, give me $35. Manipulate deductions and lump sum payments. Okay, the other cost cycle uh, fraud would be procurement fraud, buying, bid rigging, anybody that's uh, having any construction done, make sure that there is a separate project manager that's, that's controlling that project, not somebody within the organization. All bids should be put out, brought in, sealed envelopes, and opened together. Employees in collusion with vendors, we've discussed that previously, and vendor fraud. Again, that's invoicing. Um, false uh, services, not getting the goods received, it should be gone. Okay, so how do we prevent all this? Well, let's have a fraud policy in place to begin with. Let your employees know, hey, you know, this is the deal, this is what's going to happen. Codes of conduct. You can have an internal audit, if you're a bigger organization, you may have an internal audit department. You can have an external audit, and you can have a hotline. A lot of fraud is detected through tips. And people who have left the organization, who knew what was going on, who didn't want to say anything because they didn't want to lose their job, who got fired for whatever reason, now you get a phone call saying, hey, for the last three years, my manager will be doing this. OK, so in terms of the fraud policy, it increases the probability of discovery. When people know what's out there, 
they tend to be more careful. It decreases the probability of occurrence. It defines acceptable and conduct dealings. In other words, what are we going to do if we catch somebody? How are we going to handle it? Are we going to have an investigation? Are we going to call the police? How is it going to affect the organization? How is it going to affect our image? Do we want it to get out into the public domain? Are we going to continue getting funding? These are all things that you have to look at. Okay, you define the responsibilities for prevention and detection. You may have somebody within the organization who people can go to. Could be a trustworthy person. And you need to state the, the consequences. What is going to happen? Code of conduct. Uh, this relates to all uh, aspects of employment, honesty, integrity, actions, tone at the top. Very important tone at the top. It has to come from the top down. It has to come from your board of directors. They have to set this in motion. Because there's no point in putting a policy in place if the people at the top are not going to abide by it. Okay, deterrence to internal fraud. System deterrence. Okay, let's have good hiring practices. Okay, when we're hiring somebody, let's make sure that what they say is on their resume is the truth. Okay, check them out. Okay, we need to have adequate supervision and control. I do the books for some organizations. I'm the only one that's doing the books because they can't afford to segregate the duties. They can't afford to hire anybody else. So how do I protect myself? Okay. Well, the bank statement comes, comes in, it goes straight to the EED. I then get the bank statement. I do the reconciliation. I then say to her, sign the reconciliation. Sign it off. To say that well, we've gone through it. We've looked at it. I get her to sign off on all my journal entries. I got to protect myself as much as protect the organization. Keep adequate books and records, proper authorization. Make sure that there is a system where um, processes are, are followed and um, things are authorized correctly. Segregation of duties. Again, not all organizations can do this. If possible, you should be segregating the duties. The person who takes the cash to the bank shouldn't be doing the reconciliation, the bank reconciliation, shouldn't be applying it to accounts receivable. Those types of duties need to be segregated. Employee programs. We could have programs on fraud to teach people about it. So people know what's going on. <laughs> we could have programs in place for drug addiction, for alcoholics. Let your employees know that, hey, you got a problem? Let's deal with it. Not when it's too late, when you've already taken the money off the books. Internal audit. And construct a red flag program. Look at your own organization. Physical deterrence, well, combination locks, card access, security, password controls. I think everybody's familiar with all them. Deterrence to external fraud. Use honest suppliers. Do background GST checks. You can go on the CRA website and you can actually check out the bank, making sure that they give you the correct GST number. It could be collecting GST and not handing it over. They could have, an, they could have an, a GST number on their invoice, because they're supposed to, but it may not be valid. So of course, you're claiming back some of that GST. Whose responsibility is it? 
it's your organization's responsibility to ensure that they are dealing with the correct company. Because if the CRA come in and do an audit, I'm sure they'll want the money back. Okay. Reviews and trading at arm's length. Always make sure that you are trading at arm's length. Deal with honest customers, background checks, credit ratings, look for prior losses. A lot of this stuff's just common sense. Okay. How do you assess your risk? Well, you can use the, the fraud risk matrix. What is the likelihood of the occurrence? And what is the impact on the organization? I look at this matrix here. On the left-hand side, we have the likelihood of the occurrence. One acceptable, two acceptable, three acceptable. On the right-hand side, we have the impact of the organization. Again, it goes all the way. The green is acceptable. So therefore, we have to look at each incidence and categorize it. And this can be used for financial, and non-financial. We take a look at an example of non-financial. Let's say you have a driver, a volunteer driver, who provides a service to your clients and say takes them to the doctor. Now, what's the, what's the the likelihood that they might get into an accident? Well, it might be. The occurrence, the likelihood might be one. And what is the impact on the organization? Well, it might be a two, but we've mitigated that because we have insurance. But wait a minute, you now find out that this person has epileptic seizures. So now, how does it fit into the matrix? Well, you know, the likelihood of occurrence might be a three. Uh, but impact onto the organization, it might be nine. So it would be an unacceptable risk. So therefore, you have to take that person out of that position. Say, sorry, we can't let you drive because of that condition. What's the likelihood of the occurrence on the organization um, that the reconciliation is being done correctly? Uh, we could say, well, it's acceptable. And number three, the likelihood on the the, the uh, likelihood of occurrence that it is being done correctly is, sorry, low, it's acceptable, sorry, high. <laughs> and then what is the impact on the organization if it's not being done correctly and there's no internal controls, no re-signing at all? Well, that could be very high. And because we're not checking the bank statement, it could mean that money is going to risk. We're not catching it. We don't have the proper control in place. So the risk assessment. We, have, we need to look at management characteristics. Go into a little bit more detail. We need to look at the industry conditions. What are we doing that our competitors are doing in the same industry? How, are, we in, are we in line with them? Our operating characteristics. How do we compare to other organizations? Do we have things locked up? Employee relationships and pressures. Well, some organizations will have a policy in place where, you know, there's no relationship between employees because then collusion could be become a problem. Managers having relationships with uh, subordinates, and you need to look at your controls. 